created live on Fireside. Welcome, I'm Laura Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me live on Fireside Chat, where you can be a part of the conversation as my virtual audience. I am your host, Lori Lee Binstock. Everyone has an opportunity to ask me or our guest questions by requesting to hop on stage, but I do ask that everybody be respectful. Today's guest is Jessica DePatsy, executive producer of Dark Night of Our Soul. She is also the host of Shadow Work Library podcast. And she is actually a shadow work educator. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I think I actually popped you off stage. Are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me today. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. And what cool software. I'm all about this. I know it's it's actually really really cool. You people can pop in and pop out and listen to replays and join in on the conversation, which I really love because I I feel like a lot of people are interested in in, ta- in talking to a lot of my guests about you know things that are that that they're doing, how people are healing. Um, and you, you are a shadow work educator, which I think is really cool. And so I want to learn more about that. But I also want to know a little bit about your story and what got you into this work. Okay, great. So, uh, wow, where do I start? You know, it's interesting that we're having this conversation on your show, the Trauma Survivor Thriver podcast, because my story isn't that remarkable, but I think it's common. And I I think that's why it's worth sharing the lack of extravagance around it and more the, um, the universal story that everybody has trauma, you know, in the documentary that we're working on right now. One of the experts, Anderson Todd, who is the uh, assistant director of wisdom and consciousness studies out of the University of Toronto, he says um, nobody gets out of the parking lot without putting dents in the car, right? And so <laughs> that is that I was, is I was like, that's so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so my story is uh, basically growing up, I felt like there was a purpose to the trials that I would put myself in. You know, a lot of the traumatic experiences that one might experience happen to us. And it's kind of a fabric, the fabric of our human experience. You know, challenges happen and some are very remarkable and some like mine are just like, you know, my mom was, she's Korean and she felt strange in a new country. And I adopted that feeling strange, but in my own country. You know, and so the traumatic experience that I had was having a really strong thought form that I'm not accepted, that I am rejected. And I would put myself in a lot of situations where I would reject people before they rejected me. And that was a coping mechanism that I uh, learned later on. But yeah, for me, it was some pretty severe bullying and like isolation from about the fourth grade to the eighth grade. And crystallizing in myself that um, I'm weird, I'm unwanted. And so, yeah, I just realized in that experience, now looking in hindsight and having that really affect me as an adult, I needed to look at what is this? You know, there aren't, there weren't a ton of resources or I didn't even think I needed a resource to resolve that. And so that's how I started getting into shadow work because as I grew up, got into high school, got into university, I then realized that I am intentionally putting myself into these situations that are harmful for myself. Why am I doing that? Because I'm definitely learning from all these experiences. And is this the way to learn? Is obstacle really the way? Mm. Is there a silver lining to all of this? And so that's what I've been exploring basically as my life's work since. That's fascinating. You know, that's really interesting. You say, you know, it's not that extravagant, you know, your life story, but your story is so many other people's stories. Um, I feel like a lot of people, you know, well, I, I, in, in so many different ways feel isolated. They feel like an outsider. 
and they feel different and that makes them feel weird. And, you know, I, I felt like that as well. I'm a, I'm a child of immigrant parents. Um, and it did, it did feel, you know, I, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. And at that time there, there weren't a lot of other Filipinos, um, in where I lived, I lived by the beach. Um, and so I didn't realize that I was, I was different until, you know, it was pointed out to me. And then I was like, oh, I am different. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, so I feel like there are people, especially, you know, in fourth grade that, uh, you know, that feel different, but they don't know why. And I, 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 I'm so fascinated. When did you feel when you were an adult that you needed to explore this? And how did you decide like, okay, I'm going to do shadow work or is there someone that you met or you talked to who mm. introduced you to this? So I would say when I was younger, I was in a really um, locked into an observer period. One might call that disassociation, but it was a very mm. top down experience of my own life and constantly thinking like, what is wrong with me that people don't want to talk to me? At this point right now, I know that it was my own thought form and that I like co-created that existence for myself. But as a kid, you know, I'm just like, why am I so weird? Like, what is up with this? And having every lunch, by, I was just like dreading recess, dreading lunch because I'd have to sit by myself and uh, mm -hmm. all of that. And just constantly thinking like, there's something wrong with me. I have to figure this out. I have to figure this out. So when I went to a different school um, in high school, it's like, I'm going to be different. I know I'm an extroverted person. I know that I can have conversations with people. I know that I'm another version of myself in there somewhere that I haven't given myself the option to be, right? But mm -hmm. in doing that, I I hadn't I didn't have any tools. I didn't have any friends and I couldn't or I didn't want to talk to my parents about it because I wanted them to be proud of me. I didn't want to tell them that, you know, I'm suffering and I'm mm -hmm. like lonely and all these things. I had pride, right? And so all I had was myself. And with a lack of tools and resources, I turned to drinking. So that's kind of how I got into high school. And to give myself some credit, I did learn quite a bit around social social cues, like socializing myself in that experience. Mm -hmm. But also with that, I developed this habit of needing booze to access this part of myself. And so with that habit, it followed me into university. Again, not a very remarkable story. And I, I keep highlighting that because it's normalized to drink a lot in college and through mm -hmm. high school. Uh, but it really isn't, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think these younger generations, the ones that are going through it right now, they're understanding this. They know more than we did back in the yeah. day which is so amazing. But back in my day, you know, like when did I graduate um, university? It was like 2010 or so. Uh, that was the standard, you know, blacking out every weekend was not uncommon, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Problem. Um, my mom is super psychic. She just called me. She always knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, I got to a point where I was graduating university. I was starting a corporate career and the sales force that I joined was really old school, like 90s sales floor, everybody in suits, real cool, fun hustle, um, lots of money. And with that, drugs and alcohol were a thing. But I looked, I had the awareness somehow at that point to be like, these people are not happy. You know, I'm not trying to be at this company for the next <laughs> five years and turn into this. <laughs> like no shade, but this is not where I'm trying to go. So I realized like, I'm the only one that can save myself from this. I haven't created like a full on alcohol addiction. You know, I'm like a weekend warrior. I justify a lot of these things, but I know I can pull myself out of it. So I really dove into what I know now is shadow work, but before was just this exploration, um, this cultivating of my own experience and pulling myself out and having these pauses before I would do the thing um, to understand more about about what it is that I'm doing, right? And so that opened me up to a whole world of, of shadow work, of things like even astrology, which I got really into, which was super helpful to understand um, my own experience in terms of archetypal energies that one's working with. Mm. Uh, looking into young, even, let's see, what else came up? Um, the tarot. Tarot is really interesting, you know? I mean, yeah. 
You can look at it from a divination standpoint, which a lot of people wouldn't subscribe to. But if you look at it just from an archetypal perspective and seeing how your life relates to the images that come, it can be a really great way to expand your consciousness. Yes. I have to say my my husband's grandmother actually reads tarot cards and what? she reads mine every once in a while. It's really, it's really fun. I'm like, yes. I'm, I'm like, I need it. I need, I, I need a couple hours with her to do that though. Cause she, she, she loves to go on and it's, she's really fascinating. So yes, I do love, love looking at tarot cards. Um, but something I actually saw going through your Instagram feed, I I mean, I know I was stalking, um, but I <laughs> I noticed that you did a lot of work in Cambo. Yes. Yeah. I, so in this whole exploration of like testing the human experience, because, you know, now, so back in the day, I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations and I learned from them and it, I was doing it unintentionally. I say intentionally, but I just mean I put myself there. I didn't have a lot of experiences that happened at me or to me, right? Mm-hmm. I was a creator of my own experience in the very like textbook way. Um, so in this phase of life where I've pulled myself out of the muck, out of the trial and error portion, and I'm like, okay, how can I actually intentionally test my edges of the human experience, of my own experience in a way that I've gotten pretty good at doing? I'm, I feel very comfortable in the unknown and well, to an extent, um, and with ambiguity, And so combo, which is uh, for anyone listening that's not aware of what it is, it's a uh, secretion from a frog that lives down in South America. And you, uh, well, it was traditionally used for hunting. It's a non-psychedelic medicine and they will harvest this secretion from this frog in a very gentle way. So it doesn't hurt the animal. And then you do uh, several superficial burns into the top layer of your skin. So you're not going into the bloodstream. It's just very quick little burn. And then uh, you can have a facilitator apply this medicine to these burn sites. They call them gates. And in that experience, it's really hard. (laughs) Like uh, it cleans out your lymphatic system, but the feeling sense of it is getting really, really sick. Like it's Mm. like getting the flu in the worst way possible for about 10 (laughs) minutes. So it's really short. Uh, Most people will purge um, out of their mouths. You throw up and you're fasting. So you're just throwing up a a liquid that you need to drink a certain amount of before, Uh, or you'll go to the bathroom later or uh, you'll sweat. There are lots of different ways of purging. You'll shake, you might cry. And so like, why would you even want to do that? If it's a non-hallucinogenic and you just feel sick, what is the point other than cleaning out your lymphatic system? Tell me well, more. <laughs> yeah, right. There's more, I promise. <laughs> Not just like doing this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> it, it creates a kind of psychological re- resilience, you know? It, and in doing that, the magic of this medicine also clears out your brain of a lot of the, the BS that's been stuck there. It's like, it's like biohacking 10 hours of meditation in 10 minutes. Now Mm -hmm. you feel it, it's not a good time, but afterwards so much clarity and so much space is created between the things that you thought were problems and your actual body. So I would say to to kind of close the loop on that experience, it's a nice embodied kind of practice to go through because it really grounds you into the present moment. So a lot of times people will do combo before they go into ceremony um, for something like ayahuasca because you can be really nervous going into something like that. You know, you have all these things, all these intentions, all these fears, which are perfectly normal because it's such a powerful medicine to work with. Combo is a really great thing to do before because it clears you out, it brings you into the present moment, and it can give you that groundedness. Um, yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I, I'm a huge advocate for psychedelics. I, um, I really credit psychedelics to my own personal healing. Um, I'm a childhood sexual Mm. abuse survivor. And Mm. so for the longest time, I had no idea what, what what was wrong with me. I just knew something, you know, I thought like, okay, oh, there was a point where I was by diagnosed bipolar. uh, And I was on like lithium and all these medications for like 10 years. And then I was like, someone talked to me about PTSD and sexual abuse. And I was like, if you're not a soldier, you still can get PTSD. Like, I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me more. And and then I realized like, oh, I've been struggling with PTSD. I went to treatment. I 
just so happened to meet several people in the psychedelic underground and they had helped me so much in in really understanding and i think this is where kind of the shadow work right you just kind of go into the dark places of your mm-hmm. soul where you if you are able to experience that or or face it is that it would you say that's where post traumatic growth grows from Mm, yeah, that's that's a really good question. So, oh gosh, where do we want to start with that? Um, so your your acknowledgement of PTSD is really interesting. You know, it's it's interesting to think about a time where that didn't exist. Right. PTSD as a function has always existed, but the name for it, the recognition of it, didn't really come about until like the late seventies. So it was super recent. And interestingly. Um, post-traumatic growth was also scientifically named and more or less discovered at the same time. Now, you can imagine why PTSD really took off in terms of acknowledgement versus the growth aspect of it, which I'll get into in a second, which is probably, you know, if I want to get like real talk about it, it's, it, you make money keeping people sick, right? Mm, yep. And so, hey, if something quote, bad happens to you, you have PTSD, here's your diagnosis. Now, the benefit of that is clearly these are things that we need to know about because PTSD is very, very real, Um, super real, right? And also the the unacknowledgement, that's a bad word, but, you know, whatever, like not (laughs) acknowledging (laughs) the, the possible psychological benefits of going through the hard thing with a sense of agency, with the right resources is just irresponsible because then, you know, maybe you can relate to this when you're diagnosed with something that can be crystallized in your identity. Mm. And so as we've picked up the torch on exploring post-traumatic growth again, one of the things that we learned very early on is PTSD and post-traumatic growth, PTG, can happen at the same time. You know, growth isn't linear. And what is growth even? That was a huge, huge question that we had to answer if we wanted to create a documentary around post-traumatic growth. These definitions that are really difficult to explore. First of all, what is even trauma and what is growth? We know post, it's after, Mm -hmm. but trauma, right? Um, There were so many people with different explanations of what it is. And you've heard things like big T trauma and little T trauma, you know, but it's almost like we give a... um, we put them on a scale. Like little T trauma isn't as important as big T trauma. Well, if it's important to you, you know, pain is pain. Right. right? And that was something that I'm still like, I even started off this conversation by saying, oh, my story isn't that interesting. Right. But to me, it was very interesting. You know, to me, it set my life on a trajectory that I'm very grateful for, but would have been completely different if it didn't exist. And so when we add a a a ranking system to trauma, I think that's when people can sort of check out of that word. They don't like to associate with it because, hey, I'm not a victim or nothing really bad happened to me. I might be suffering. I might have full-blown PTSD, but I don't acknowledge it because, you know, I don't have this this crazy story. And so the best definition of trauma that we heard came from, again, Anderson Todd, who talked about trauma as a uh, kind of like when trust is broken, you know, Mm -hmm. I trust that I'm going to go through subconsciously my childhood being safe with your example. I I subconsciously trust that I'm not going to be sexually abused, that the people that are around me, um, care for me, you know, and sure they may be doing their best and they're, they're dealing with life in whatever way possible, but they're not going to do something that horrible to me. Um, trust being broken in that, when dad tells you he's going to pick you up from soccer pra- or be at your soccer game and he doesn't go over and over and over again, that is, can be traumatic, that it, you know, yeah. little tr- T, whatever. But then it becomes, oh, I can't trust my dad. I can't trust men. I can't trust myself. And so that definition was really helpful moving forward. And then when we talked about growth, well, the vast majority, I would say actually everybody that was in the documentary also has PTSD, right? We have veterans that have had long careers seeing things that no, none of us will ever see. 
Uh, we have, you know, murder attempt survivors and they still get triggered by things, right? They still feel serious lows. They still feel like things are at times unbearable, but the way that growth works and the way that we've defined it is an expansion of consciousness, which is seeing your experience from many different perspectives, being able to feel into life in a very full way. And so that was one of the interesting things about this whole thing is that growth doesn't look like the way a lot of people might, or conventional wisdom might say it is. It's not necessarily associated with achievement and success and being happy all the time. Right. Because if you ask these people that have lived experiences of post-traumatic growth that are now of service, they have turned their mess into a message more or less. Mm -hmm. They have like found this deep appreciation for life. They um, have meaning and they can see meaning in little things that a lot of people that haven't acknowledged the adversity in their life has created more wisdom and all these things, you know, inner strength. These people that have really identified, I'm a post-traumatic growth person, they feel everything. So there's this level of sensitivity as well that uh, like is not so productive sometimes, you know, to go through life like that. But when you talk to these people, the level at which they can feel their highs and their lows, they're here for all of it. And that's one of the things that when we look at the way society's um, systems work today, it's not totally designed for that kind of person, but they wouldn't have it any other way, you know, to be able to have these conversations with people like you that are affecting um positively so many people that have gone through traumatic experiences you know if you didn't go through that then maybe they wouldn't be healing you know and so there's this trickle out effect of of working with the material that you've been presented in your past life in a way that is um is for like the higher good of of future generations and so that's really actually the whole note that we end on in this documentary is and this is a bit controversial and it's tricky to say without a lot of context, but we ask the question, is it a moral responsibility to acknowledge your traumas, to do the shadow work, to go into the dark places, to reclaim the pieces of yourself that have been fragmented? You know, um, because when we look at this long list of social issues and environmental issues and all the things, right? Mm -hmm. We can see that the answers to them are very short-sighted. Now, why is that? You know, uh, it's likely because the people that are making these decisions, the policymakers, politicians, the educators, parents, anybody who has any kind of influence, we all have something that if we're not doing the inner work, what manifests as our outer life's work, the decisions we make, how we show up in the world, only ha it has a limitation. So perhaps it is our moral responsibility to really look at the things that have happened to us and for us, if I wanted to be cliche about it, <laughs> for future generations. I absolutely, I love that question. And, I, I, and for me, the answer is yes, right? I feel that, you know, you know in, in my June's issue of Authentic Insider, a woman writes about vicarious resilience. And I mm -hmm. feel like, when you hear other people's stories, when, you know, other, other people, it, it helps other people want to start healing. Because to be honest, before I actually started my healing journey, I'm, I'm like, if you told me about post-traumatic growth, I thought I would think you were full of shit. I was like, nope, this is my life. This is who I am. That I'm supposed to be sad a lot of most of my life. And this is, this is it. Um, because I had just, it just couldn't, I could not understand anything other than what I was living in um, mm -hmm. until I hit like rock bottom and then I had to go into treatment. Um, but it was, I, I feel like once I actually explore, I like really, really tried to resist exploring those dark places. I never in 2020, 2020 was the first time he even like uttered the words sexual abuse. And I think mm -hmm. um, for for me, as it pertained to me, because I was sexually abused by my father, which has its own, you know, layers of shit you don't want to go into. But mm -hmm. it was once I was able to go into it, though, 
once I was able to talk about it, the first time I actually talked about it in a group of people, they were like, they came to, a couple of them came to me and they were like, that actually happened to me and I haven't talked mm -hmm. about it. Even though they had been in this treatment center that I was in for probably a month longer than I was. But when they were able to start talking about what happened to them, then that was when like their healing process and their ability to move out of this treatment center started accelerating. So it was, it, it's, it, I do believe that there is, once we've gone to this place, once we've achieved post-traumatic growth, I guess, I feel like, yes, there, there's, there's a responsibility there to tell your story. But Thank you so me. much for sharing that. That is like a really remarkable story of, um, of resilience, you know, and I'm so glad that you brought up hitting your rock bottom and that being the thing that, that woke you up to this kind of work. You know, what's interesting about that is a lot of people are living in a, um, like a lot of people don't hit a kind of rock bottom that wakes them up which I mm -hmm. think is why a lot of people do psychedelics. It's like, I just have this hovering dirt cloud of, of shit, <laughs> like this feeling yeah. of, you know, unpleasantness <laughs> that's just hovering around. And so maybe psychedelics can work and it shows you all the things you've been tolerating, right? It shows mm -hmm. you, you feel, you can feel like you're at your rock bottom in a way that you've facilitated for yourself. And I think that that is one of the, uh, flaws in our in the way society is is built today is like there's so many ways to distract you from having a rock bottom moment so people yeah. that um like yourself and a lot of people that i've talked to in the research of this project they have really like intense traumatic experiences that the rock bottoms that they hit are remarkable right they can experience post-traumatic growth in also then remarkable ways because they've seen a version of themselves they've that is unbearable right yeah now for your i don't know i guess you can say average person still having traumatic experience but you know i can distract myself with netflix or shopping or working out or all of these things or dating apps or jumping from relationship to relationship so i never feel that rock bottom you know all right. this convenience that we have in our life that is supposed to keep us quote happy but just keeps us more or less from experiencing that dark night of our soul. And that's not to say that we don't see hints of it. We don't see hints of, you know, laying in bed at night and being like, what is, what is all of this? This has got to change. But then, you know, maybe I'll just listen to a podcast to go to sleep instead of having these thoughts. Right. So, you know, the title of the documentary, Dark Night of Our Soul, is a call to action more or less to stop distracting yourself and to just contemplate what is hiding in your own underworld so that you don't have to hit a rock bottom because, you know, we can keep this hovering sense of unpleasantness our whole lives and the rock bottom might be, and I hate to be like grotesque about it, but you know, when we're older, hopefully we get to that point, living a long life, being on the deathbed and that being perhaps your rock bottom moment of like, I should have I should have looked at all this. You know, I, I, I had all these relationships that were right there in front of my face, but I was not able to love enough because I wasn't able to like reclaim the parts of myself that made me feel like me again or made me feel like me for the first time, period. Yeah. Yeah. When so, I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm just going to conclude there that you know, even when I say this, I get a little bit emotional because – I really feel the impact of this work um, lies on our generation's shoulders, you know, yeah. because we're coming to a precipice around like the level of depression that the world, just like on a global scale, I don't have the number, but it's like a lot of people, you know, it's like yeah. one in three people and we'll have some kind of diagnosable quote, mental disorder that can be preventable by, I think, looking at some of the material that has created these coping mechanisms that have then become habitual. I mean, if we even look at hoarders, there's something like 18 million hoarders just in the U.S. I don't know if that number is true or not, but, <laughs> you know, that, that is one very specific, like, manifestation of a group of people that um, 
have perhaps unresolved traumas. You know, so the, just the numbers are huge. And when we look at the ways that we are coping through consumerism, it's destroying our planet. And I don't know what the timeline is for that, but, you know, what world are we leaving for our kids? So, yeah, this, this feels like it feels like important work. It is important work. I absolutely agree. And, you know, going back to, you know, this idea of like little T trauma, right? I feel like people, m the majority of people who just kind of live in that space of, uh, I'm just dealing, I'm dealing, I'm dealing. I feel like they've dealt mm -hmm. with little T trauma. And because they haven't dealt with big T trauma, they don't think that there's anything that they need to explore. And I think that that's also why we need to make people more aware that like little t trauma is trauma and and not exploring it can be a problem and yeah it's so easy to distract yourself like you said with so much um and you know for me i i, I just couldn't right i had children that were triggering me that were, it was just like oh my gosh my daughter is reminding me of of these moments that i don't want to relive and i need this needs to go away. Um, but, you know, what's nice about being able to have also, you know, going back to what we were talking about exploring, you know, is it our responsibility to explore those dark places? I really feel it like if I didn't, I don't know what would be there for my daughter because my daughter, my son, I, I think my son benefited the most. He's the youngest. So he's seen me, he's been with me more since of my healing. My daughter has seen both sides of me and it's been really, um, you know, I can see how it's been difficult for her. Like my son can, mm -hmm. is, is, I feel like can easily, you know, take a breath. And my daughter is more like me, you know, prior to treatment when, you know, if my husband was to say, can you, can you take a breath? Can you breathe? I'd be like, no, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, so that, you know, cause I, that's who I was. I was very much a, um, I was like, no, I, nothing's going to help. Leave me alone. Um, and then, you know, coming out of treatment, it was like, no, this, this is stuff that actually works. When I was, when I was at my treatment center, they actually, they did biofeedback and you can see like what breathing actually did when you actually took deep breaths and you saw like your, your, your energy. It was just, it was amazing. And it, it made it more concrete for me to help my children be mm. able to manage these stresses by simply taking a breath or really talking about what happened um, in their day. And I oh, think, yeah, yeah it's, just just exploring it that way and being okay with sharing like the bad stuff and being okay with it oh for sure you know like having kids I, I don't have any kids myself but I was talking to one of the other uh experts in our film Dr. Trung No who's a resilience researcher and he was talking about like the other things we often talk about trauma as things that are bad, right? Mm -hmm. But they can also be things that are good, but you're different on the other side of it. You know, having kids is a really great example of that. Having children can be traumatic. Like it just changes <laughs> your whole life, you know? Yes. And things that didn't bother you before, you know, are like all of a sudden important and require attention and things you used to enjoy. Just the whole snow globe of your brain gets sh shaken up. Uh, winning the lottery is another good example. A lot of people win the lottery. That's good. But it can be also be traumatic. There's like a whole bunch of other things that pop up as yeah. a result of that. And to your point about, you know, your relationship with your daughter being a little bit different than your relationship to your son, what I wanted to also add in there around this moral responsibility to do the work, it's it's also saying that it's not your responsibility or it's not a you should heal. Because that, that's where things get tricky, you know? Mm -hmm. It's okay to be somebody's bad day. Because this is, like, we have to subscribe in some way to surrendering to the way life plays out. Like, things will make sense at some point, you know? Um, the We're part of this complex fabric of the way the universe is tied together, you know? So we can look at like my mom, for example, she, after d starting this work, she was feeling like a lot of shame around herself and 
by transferring her own unresolved trauma onto me, you know, this sense of uh, unacceptance and rejection that I talk about often when I go on podcasts and on my own show. And she's like, God, if I just had worked on that earlier in my life, because she's working on it now, you wouldn't have that. And you wouldn't have to go through any of this. I'm like, mom, like, yeah, I did. I did suffer, but I'm so grateful for the way that I dealt with that and the other, um, the bits of agency that you did instill in me that I can change because that's one of the big things around this kind of work is a sense of agency. Um, you know, I just, I wouldn't be doing this at all. And I don't know where I'd be, what I'd be doing, but I love what I do now, you know? So we can look at our children, let's say, you know, for anybody listening that, uh, has had a two-phased life, you know, one child experienced a version that you weren't proud of, you Mm -hmm. know? but that can turn into something remarkable that we have no idea. So the only thing I think, well, I don't think, this is from research, uh, post-traumatic growth research that has come uh, out of the wave of COVID, considering the whole world went through a collective trauma in many different facets, whether that was uh, experiencing family deaths, a fear of government control, like any way, which way, people are different on the other side of this, right? It comes up in conversation often. Families are looking a lot different. The way people go out in public can be different. Um, a lot of friendships were dissolved from different, you know, value systems that were conflicting that just weren't able to be resolved. So this new wave of research has shown that, okay, is what sets somebody up for post-traumatic growth? You know, what can we help instill in our children if they are going through it or or are going to go through it? Because we all kind of do. Um, there's no difference in extroversion or introversion, really. The benefit of being more of an extroverted type is that, um, like the ability to share your story with other people and to bring in people into your own experience. Like you were talking about when you're in treatment, when you shared, it was really helpful. You're able to get feedback and you put some distance between your own inner world and like, and you, you know, mm-hmm. you put it out there, you, you brought light to it. Uh, the benefit of being more introverted is you may have a more uh, like colorful inner world to contemplate why things have happened. Um, but there is a difference between openness and a lack of openness. If we were to look at the big five scale. Openness to new experiences is one of the markers of post-traumatic growth in terms of personality. So that's where we can start talking about in, intentionally uh, working with our kids or working with ourselves. I'll, I'll talk ourselves first. Mm-hmm. One of the topics that we explore here is intentionally facilitated post-traumatic growth which is a big concept to jump from, did you know you have trauma to you can intentionally facilitate your own, right? (laughs) It's like we had a lot of ground to cover there. But the point is to build capacity. So the more new experiences you put yourself in, the more you can subconsciously realize that I am capable and you collect more data around what you can get through. So I think that's why people like working out um, in ways that are more intense, like HIIT workouts or traveling or um, meeting new people or doing psychedelics, right? Like the more experiences you can put yourself into, the more ways you see you can expand your capacity to be in them. Mm -hmm. So when we work with our kids and we show them that you can be different, here are some ways that you can be different, whether that's helping them go into sports, like group sports is one kind of thing, or if they're more of a solo person, like martial arts, but really helping them intentionally um, test some of those edges in microdosing, in a more microdosing capacity, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that when you get the flood dose of adversity (laughs) which is going to happen at some point it's like oh yeah I've been I've been training for this and this is okay wow yes it you know it it reminds me of a um a really great quote from someone that I interviewed a while ago he was an NHL former NHL player Dave Scatcherd he Mm -hmm. um after I think it was his fifth concussion he it was like oh it was a near fatal concussion and he was like in his 30s getting dementia um Mm -hmm. and he told me because he said he spent his whole life just like this happy guy like everything everything was kind of you know he's working hard doing you know achieving things and then once he hit that 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 fifth con- got that fifth concussion and nearly died you know he and he was sh- suffering and he realized like 
he said that God came to him when he was like ready to just throw in the towel and he was, he was ready to take his own life that he said, he was like, he spoke to me and he said that I, I needed you to go through what you had to go through so you can help the people that you're going to help. Mm. Because he was saying that, you know, you know, there was a, before that had happened, he'd be like, Oh, just suck it up. Just, you know, you broke your arm, you, you know, you broke your, whatever, your, a puck hit your teeth. You just, you know, just get up and let's do, let's just do this. Right. It's like, let's, let's go. But he said that he had to go through the suffering to really understand what it was like to be able to help other people. Um, because mm-hmm. now he is a coach. Um, he's a, he's a life coach. He's a, um, for, for, for athletes and, you know, a, um, and so he, he had to understand the only way he could understand other people's suffering was going through the suffering himself because he was just ready to give up. And I just thought that was just an amazing way to look at it. Like right, right now, like, I mean, I'm, I don't know who I would be if all of the things that happened to me didn't happen, like you were saying, Mm -hmm. but, but I'm happy where I am now. And so I think that's, 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 that's the growth. That's the, that's the growth there. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up, um, you know, a former athlete, like that is that performer type, you know, we work a lot with veterans and first, first responders. Athletes also fall into that category. Um, entrepreneurs, people that have like grit, right. And they're Mm -hmm. used to practice and training to present something, whether that's to present themselves perfectly, more or less in the arena of sports or on the battlefield or in business. And um, one of the interesting bits of research that we came across is that you can go from, you don't have to be, okay, so talking suicidality right now, Mm -hmm. which is the ultimate like lack of agency, getting to the point of like, I can't change and this is it. Right. And then pulling the plug on your experience. Um, so we wanted to study that to see what is the ultimate giving up moment, right? When people are like, there is no growth left for me. The only way is this way. And this bit of research that we found showed that there, you can go from being perfectly quote, okay, to suicidality fairly quickly once you have committed yourself to um, a lack of being able to change. And so I bring up performers because this is especially prevalent in that kind of archetype, which I would consider myself to fall into as well, which is like a bit of a failed hero story. You know, Um, my whole life cultured, nourished, nurtured to perform and to show up and all these things. And at a point where like, let let's say this gentleman gets traumatic brain injury to the point where he is just like super different on the other side of that. The things that he valued above everything else likely was the, the entertainment, the, the joy that he brought through his, his work. Right. And now that that's gone, who am I even? Mm. And so a big part of this doing this work is acknowledging grace. You know, like if we go back to what is growth even, um, it's not being happy all the time, but it does mean feeling joy in your sorrow, feeling the okayness in being wherever you're at. So I can really relate to that story because I haven't experienced traumatic brain injury myself, but I was married to a um, Jeff DePazzi, who's also the producer of this documentary. He has traumatic brain injury. And when that started to flare up, it was unbearable to him and to me the emotional waves, the, um, all the things that come with that. And because it's a brain injury, it makes it a little bit extra tricky to work with, you know, the healing process on a physiological, like in, in terms of how your body heals, it, it's kind of different than a lot of, um, the other psychological wounds that can happen. And so for him to acknowledge grace in his, what he felt to be weakness, not being able to show up, not being able to be the husband that he wanted to be, um, being incapacitated at moments, you know, not being able to reach out to people like without that grace. And he, don't get me wrong. He had moments of like no grace. He was just mm-hmm. like this 
is horrible and I don't know what to do with myself anymore. Um, but that okayness with, with what would be identified as weakness for a performer is super, super huge. And it takes time. And, um, yeah, what is grace even like an acknowledgement that, that this is all part of it. Yeah. Right. The, the lows, the, the coming to Jesus moment, like that's what those lows can be. And it's hard when you're in those, in your rock bottom, I don't know if there's a lot of work to be done there. Like when you're really going through it and you're feeling everything, I think the strategy there is to breathe and write it out. But when you come back into a point of neutrality, that's where I think the work begins. It's, it's, an, it's a contemplation of like, what was that? Where did that come from? You know, now that you have the space, instead of just going right back to life and being like, okay, well, I'm good again. You know, I'm just going to ignore that. That happened. <laughs> Like that's where you put in the reps. (laughs) Right. I agree. I agree. It was, you know, when you're in it, there's really not much you can do. Mm -hmm. You're just, you're, you're, you just, I feel like you can just go down, right? Like I felt like that I was just going down my rabbit hole when I hit the rock bottom and I was, I was just like, there's nothing for me. Um, Mm -hmm. Luckily I had my husband who was like, okay, you can do this. We're going to do this. (laughs) We're going to do this. Um, But yeah, it was, you know, I, 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 I do, and I know that this is most likely the purpose of your, your documentary, but to let everyone know that, you know, post-traumatic growth is achievable people it's, you know, and, and I feel like I, I can't stress that enough because I was there, I was there, I was there when I was just like, this is who I am. There's no, there's no way out of this. And I think mm-hmm. that there's nothing more then I want to share, then it is a possibility. There's, it's there. Exactly. That is so well said. It is a possibility because one very easy route we could have gone down with this that would have made my life a lot easier (laughs) is a, like, here are the five steps to post-traumatic growth. You know, like you too can be healed, but it's (laughs) so not that. Like this whole film is really one massive journaling prompt. You know, the answers that you get are only going to come within yourself. So it's, it's presented in a very mythopoetic way. And we're really, really careful to not say that it is, how do I say this? Just to know that it is an option, to believe that it is an option is the biggest leap of faith you can take. Yes. There's no actual work that you have to do in terms of, um, by the end of this film, I mean, like there's no actual, like you have to go see a therapist, you have to do psychedelics, you have to, have to, have to, in order to heal. What you have to do is just know that it's possible and to just open your mind to whatever comes in. So uh, one of the major themes, or I would say methodologies that we follow is Jungian psychology throughout this. And the way that that's presented is a very gentle, like awareness opening process. Everybody's experience is different. Everybody's mode of healing will be different. That's why we're a solution agnostic kind of organization because going into a treatment center may be perfect for you. Picking up the guitar may be all that you need. You know, um, learning how to cook may be everything. So to pinpoint exactly what needs to happen, what do I do next is not our responsibility to tell you what to do because that would just be impossible and like irresponsible on our end. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be the person that's like, well, just do what I did if, and it'll work for you. It might, but this is where we pass agency to the viewer. Like your own intuition will let you know, follow the clues in your life. And here are, here's the mythology that shows you that post-traumatic growth is possible throughout human history. Here are the bioevolutionary reasons why growth after trauma is actually probable, not just possible. You know, his, here's all the proof around why this is actually a thing and not just some random phenomenon that happens to people that like are lucky enough to, you know, catch the post-traumatic growth bug. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. Amazing. I mean, I could talk to you all day. I really could. I know. <laughs> That'd be great. 24-hour podcast. <laughs> I know, right? Um, but we do have to wrap it up. But um, I do want to ask if you have anything that you would like to add. 
Well, um, I think I got through all of the the juicy bits of the documentary, but we are running a Kickstarter right now until the end of June, a little bit into July, raising funds to help us finish the film. So right now, if you donate 15 bucks to the Kickstarter, you can watch a short version of the film, which is 30 minutes. And it's very good. I have to say myself. <laughs> I, I love the trailer. The trailer was amazing. I, I, I was like, I need more. So yes. Thank you. Well, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link to watch it. Uh, but for anybody listening, yeah, the donation goes towards helping us finish it. And we just actually partnered with this fantastic director out of Hollywood that is going to be re-editing our full film and just make it primed for uh, for mass media. You know, like that was one thing that in doing this process, we realized we had some limitations around what is Netflixy, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what is too complicated. <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he was like, I love this so much. Um, I'm going to set you up with the connections with the distributors and all the things that you guys don't have right now. And I want to re-edit it so that people really, it, so it really knocks people's socks off. So that was a in- huge, huge miracle for us. Um, and yeah, any funds that are donated go towards helping finish edit it. But um, also it goes towards helping us create an impact campaign so that once the film is finished, we can take this to correctional facilities and addiction centers and to um, like colleges Amazing. and yeah, to help spread the word of post-traumatic growth, raise awareness around its possibility for people that either need it the most or can make the most impact. And usually those are the same people. That's incredible. I really, I love that. I love going the this idea of going to, um, those places and and having them be able to explore this idea of post traumatic growth so incredible and you know there's that th- scrolling fortune cookie right there on your screen um and I will also have it in the show notes but you can go to that kickstarter right there so beautiful thank you so much for having me on this has been really fun Thanks. i'd love to have you on my show too one of these days let's set yeah. that up absolutely thank you so much jessica i really appreciate it that was Jessica DePatsy, shadow work educator, host of the Shadow Work Library podcast, and the executive producer of the documentary Dark Night of Our Soul. For more information on Jessica, click on that scrolling fortune cookie right there on your screen. You can, it'll also be in the show notes, um, anywhere you get your podcast. Also, June's issue of Authentic Insider is out. Check out Authentic Insider at traumasurvivorthriver.com. That's traumasurvivorthriver.com. Um, We will be back next week uh, with episode 100. You can join me live when I speak with Aaron Johnson about mental health in marginalized communities. Next week, it's going to be on a different day. Same time, though. It's going to be on Tuesday, June 13th. Um, Please join me. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. I'm Lurley Binstock. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation. Take care.